For some time now, Anne Martin had been plagued by nightmares. Dreams of her stepdaughter killed and buried under the floor of a barn. Finally, she had enough of the dreams and she went to her husband Thomas, urging him to go to the barn and investigate. The barn in question was known as the Red Barn, so named for a unique red brick roof that was a prominent landmark in Polstead. It took some convincing, but Anne was finally able to convince Thomas to go to the Red Barn to at least take a look. So on the 19th of April 1828, Thomas headed over to the Red Barn to look around. While there, he made a gruesome discovery. A sack containing the remains of his daughter Maria, badly decomposed, but still identifiable. The injuries on Maria's body appeared that she had been stabbed, shot, and strangled. Maria would also be identified by her clothing, hair, and a missing tooth by her sister. There was also evidence found that would implicate her killer. A green handkerchief that was wound around Maria's neck. A green handkerchief that belonged to a man named William Corder. Maria Martin was the daughter of Polstead mole catcher Thomas Martin and his wife Grace. She was born on the 24th of July 1801 and was said to be a quiet and intelligent young woman who could read and write very well, which was unusual for a country girl at the time. When Maria was nine years old, her mother Grace passed away. So Maria took on the role of the woman of the household, a role that she supposedly took very seriously. But Maria also valued education and she refused to let anything stand in the way of her getting that education. At some point her father Thomas would remarry a woman named Anne who then took on the responsibilities of the household, leaving Maria to focus on an education. When Maria was 17 years old, she became involved with a man named Thomas Corder. Thomas was the son of a wealthy farmer, so they were not equal in social status, and because of that, Thomas insisted that their relationship had to be kept secret. So in secret, Thomas would visit Maria in her cottage. This relationship resulted in a pregnancy and the pregnancy ended the relationship with Thomas practically abandoning Maria and their unborn child. He refused to marry her and provided little financial support, if any at all. And he was very relieved when their baby died as an infant. Some time later, Maria began a new relationship with a man named Peter Matthews, who allegedly was a respected gentleman in the community. This relationship would also result in a child, a young boy. Like Thomas, Peter did not marry Maria, but unlike Thomas, he did send money to provide for the young boy. Some time would pass and then Maria met a young man named William Corder the younger brother of Thomas. Like Thomas, he was the son of a wealthy farmer, but unlike Thomas, William was known as a troublemaker, who was forging checks and stealing animals from neighboring farms. At one time, William even sold his father's pigs, which would have gotten him into a lot of trouble with the law. But his father was able to smooth the whole thing over without the law getting involved which means that William got away with barely a slap on the wrist, which in turn meant that he kept causing trouble. His last troublesome act was when he helped a local thief steal a pig from a neighboring village. But they were caught and this proved to be too much for his father, so William was sent to London in disgrace. Some time later, his older brother Thomas would drown, attempting to cross a frozen pond, 
and William was urged to return to Polstead. Thomas wasn't the only one of William's family to die suddenly, though. William's father and his three brothers would all die within 18 months of each other. This meant that within a year and a half, William was now the only one left to run the farm with his mother. Around the time that William had assumed the duty of taking care of the farm, which would be sometime in March 1826, William, who was 22 years old, began a relationship with the 24-year-old Maria Martin. Because of Maria's previous relationships with both his older brother Thomas and Peter Matthews, not to mention their social status, William, like his brother, wished to keep their relationship a secret. But history would repeat itself when Maria became pregnant. Unlike the previous times, William promised that he would marry Maria once the child was born. Maria gave birth in 1827, but the child would only live for two weeks. William still claimed that he intended to marry Maria despite the death of their child, but the wedding had to be soon. The reason was that William had heard rumors that the parish officers were going to prosecute Maria Martin for having a third child out of wedlock, which was a crime punishable by a public whipping. So they had to elope, and they had to do it quickly. On Friday, May 18th, 1827, William arrived at the Martins' cottage during the day and told Maria that they had to leave at once. Maria's stepmother Anne was present for this conversation, and William told them that the local constable had now obtained a warrant to prosecute Maria, so they had to leave at once. Maria was concerned about them leaving during the day because people would see them, but William suggested that she dress in men's clothing to disguise herself, and he would also wear different clothing to disguise himself and they would meet up at the Red Barn, where they would change into their normal clothing before they continued to Ipswich where they would marry. With that, William left through the front door, while Maria, who was now dressed in men's clothing, left through the back door. She was now headed for the Red Barn, situated on Barnfield Hill, about half a mile from the Martins' cottage. This was the last time her family ever saw Maria. After her body was found, the police immediately began looking for William Corder. The green handkerchief that had been found around the neck of the body belonged to him, and Anne had told the police about the conversation that he had had with Maria about meeting her at the Red Barn. Now, Maria had been missing for a while, but her family was not suspicious right away, because around the same time that Maria disappeared, so did William. He would later return, and when asked where Maria was, he claimed that she was still in Ipswich, and he could not yet bring her back as his wife because it would anger his friends and his relatives. And over time, he kept giving more and more excuses why Maria could not return, and eventually these excuses were not good enough anymore for any of the residents, and they demanded to see Maria. This pressure would eventually cause William to flee the area entirely. Once he was gone, he would write letters to Maria's family, claiming that they were now married and they were living on the Isle of Wight. And in these letters he had even more excuses for why Maria didn't just contact them herself. She was either unwell, had hurt her hand, or the letter must have been lost. With each excuse, the residents of Polstead became more and more suspicious. Then, Anne Martin started having dreams about her stepdaughter. Eleven months after the body was found, the police had tracked William Corder to Evelay Grove House, which was a boarding house for ladies in Brentford. He was running this boarding house and was now married to a woman named Mary Moore, who he had met through a Lonely Hearts advertisement. An officer of the London police named James Leah went to the boarding house to investigate. He gained entry by claiming that he wished to board his daughter there, 
so Corder allowed him to enter. After coming inside, James took William aside and informed him of the charges. William denied any knowledge of the crime and even claimed that he did not know and had never even met a woman named Maria Martin. When police searched the house, they found letters addressed to William that seemed to contain warnings about the discovery of the body and the crime. They also found a passport from the French ambassador, which indicated to them that William Corder may have been preparing to flee. He was then arrested and taken back to Suffolk where he awaited trial. By now, the story of the Red Barn murder had captured everyone's attention. A young woman from the countryside was seduced by a wealthy man. A wealthy man who would then lure her to her death with the promise of marriage. That in and of itself was a good enough story for many people. But if you add the fact that Maria's body was supposedly discovered because of a dream, people's interest increased even more. In fact, the interest in this case was so great that it ended up delaying the trial for several days. But the trial would finally start on the 7th of August, 1828. Thousands of people flocked to Polstead to witness the proceedings, and the hotels quickly began to fill up from as early as the 21st of July. There were so many people that wanted to view the trial that they would not let you into the courtroom unless you had a ticket. The judge and the court officials actually had to push their way through the crowds that had gathered around the door. But once everyone was inside and seated, the trial could finally begin. William Corder was indicted on nine charges, including forgery, shooting, stabbing and strangulation. Anne Martin was called to testify. She told of the events that led to Maria's disappearance as she was in the room when William and Maria made plans to meet at a red barn. She would also speak of her dreams. Maria's father, Thomas Martin, told the court about how he had to dig up his own daughter. And the objects that were found during the search of the boarding house were also used as evidence against William. The prosecution suggested that William Corder never intended to marry Maria Martin, but she had knowledge of some of his criminal dealings, so he had to come up with a way to get rid of her. When William was asked to tell his side of the story, he admitted to being in the barn with Maria, but he claimed that they had gotten into an argument and he had left shortly after. He claimed that he was walking away from the barn when he suddenly heard a pistol shot. He ran back to the barn only to find Maria dead with one of his pistols beside her. According to William, he had then panicked and buried her under the floor. He never gave a reason for why his green handkerchief was around her neck. During his testimony, William also blamed the press for slandering his reputation and pleaded with the jury to give him the benefit of the doubt. All of that was for nothing, because it would only take the jury 35 minutes to return with a guilty verdict. And he was sentenced to death. After the trial, William was taken back to prison to await his execution. After spending three days in prison, William would finally confess to his crime to a prison chaplain. He still denied that he had stabbed Maria. He instead claimed that he had accidentally shot her in the eye after they argued while she was changing out of her disguise. He still kept to the story that after shooting her, he had panicked and buried her. On the 11th of August, 1828, just before noon, William was taken to the gallows in Bury St. Edmunds. By that point, a large crowd had gathered around the gallows. One newspaper claimed that there were 7,000 people present, but another newspaper said that it was as many as 20,000. Regardless, there was a huge crowd that watched as William Corder stepped upon the scaffold. Just before the hood was drawn over his head, he said, I am guilty, my sentence is just, I deserve my fate and may God have mercy on my soul. William Corder would then be hanged. After an hour, his body was cut down and taken back to the courtroom at Shire Hall. 
the doors were open to the public and reportedly over 5,000 people queued to see the body until 6 o'clock when the doors were shut and no longer open to the public. The following day, the dissection and post-mortem were carried out in front of an audience of physicians and students from Cambridge University. A death mask would be made of William's face and his skin was tanned and used as a cover of a book that chronicled the case. His skeleton would be reassembled, exhibited and used as a teaching aid in the West Suffolk Hospital. Later it would even be put on display in the Royal College of Surgeons of England. But in 2004, William Corder's bones were removed and cremated. Thousands of people would visit Polstead in the following years to view the places where this crime occurred. The Red Barn would be stripped of pretty much everything by souvenir hunters. Maria's gravestone was not left alone either. People would chip away at the stone to take as souvenirs until her gravestone was reduced to nothing but a small rock. As I mentioned before, there was a lot of interest in this case. While Corder was still awaiting trial, there were plays being performed of the case. There was a folk song written about the case. Authors would write books about the case. And with those books and fictional stories, rumors about the real case would emerge. One such rumor claimed that Maria's stepmother, Anne, was having an affair with William. Maria supposedly found out about the affair and was now causing them problems, so they decided to have her removed so they could continue their affair without anyone knowing about it. But then, William left and married someone else, so Anne decided to get revenge by making up the story of her strange dreams about Maria. This is just a rumor though, and there's no actual evidence to back it up, but it did make for an interesting twist for people who wanted a good story. There were so many different fictional variations of the events written and distributed that it's actually become very difficult to discern fact from fiction regarding this case. The most factual records about this is the records from the trial but what's considered to be the best record of the events surrounding the case is that of James Curtis, who was a journalist who spent time with William Corder and two weeks in Polstead interviewing everyone involved with the case. This case would fascinate so many people at the time and this fascination has continued into now the 21st century. There have been five film versions made of this case and it has been dramatized for radio several times and even more books have been written about it. True crime is one of the fastest growing genres and recently there have been a lot of discussion on whether or not true crime as content is inappropriate. With the main question being if this type of content can desensitize people to real life tragedies or, like in the case of the Red Barn murder, spread misinformation and make it difficult to discern what is true and what isn't. It is a debate and a discussion that should be had, I think. Because I think it's important to remember that these people were or are real people. They're not just stories told for entertainment. That is something that I try to remember when I make my own videos, though I suspect I'm not always very successful. Anyway, my point with this is that despite the more recent debates about true crime as content, this case proves that it's not a new phenomenon. People have always been fascinated by this type of content. The Red Barn murder happened almost 200 years ago and it still fascinates people to this day. One small silver lining is this. With each retelling of this case, the memory of Maria Martin remains. And hopefully she is now resting in peace. <laughs>